So with me here is Professor Dr. Claudio Bassetti, Professor of Neurology, Director of the Department of Neurology, Dean at the Medical Faculty University Hospital in Bern, Switzerland, and President of the European Academy of Neurology. Professor Bassetti, welcome to Cluj-Napoca and congratulations on the Dr. Honoris Causa Award received from the Julio Hatziaganu University of Medicine and Pharmacy for your long-lasting involvement and collaboration with the Neurosciences Department. And uh, for the beginning, I would so much like to know uh, what this award means to you. It means a lot. Uh, it's a great uh, recognition. I'm very honored. I'm also very pleased to be in Cluj-Napoca, as you mentioned. It's a long-standing partnership, scientific partnership, but I would like to stress also a long-standing friendship to the department, to Professor uh, Daphne Mureșanu, to his team, and I would say to the entire um, community in Romania. I had the possibility over the years to visit different uh, places with him and through him, and so I feel very close uh, to the entire neuroscience community in Romania. So congratulations once again for this, for this award. Um, and talking about uh, research, considering your unique background in sleep research and in uh, disorders, sleep disorders, what do you think are the following most exciting developments in this field? Well, you know, there is a big question about the function of sleep. It seems a little bit uh, strange to, to some extent. Uh, if you think that uh, the reason that we sleep still remains somewhat unknown or at least uh, there is still some uh, discussions and debate. So I, th I think we start understanding better the reasons that we sleep and I should mention that as a neurologist uh, uh, it is important to stress the fact that we sleep mainly not only for the brain. So there is something about sleep that uh, helps uh, the functions of the brain. Memory function are supported by sleep but also other uh, cognitive functions are supported by the sleep. And on the other hand, we understand that if we have sleep loss, we have health consequences for the body, but also for the brain. I have been involved in studies showing that sleep loss and sleep apnea, mm -hmm. which is a frequent sleep disorder, may lead also to an increased risk of stroke and dementia. So there are more understanding about this bi-directional relationship between sleep, brain and brain disorders. And I think the future is really to understand how we can promote sleep, how we can use sleep to promote health. So I think uh, this is one of the big avenues of the future. How can we promote uh, better lives, better functions, better brains uh, through a better sleep? So sleep definitely is a must. Sleep is a must, it's not a must. alone, obviously. We cannot uh, sleep ourselves completely into health. We need to take into account a diet, you know, a healthy diet. And then we is have there too much sleep? There is sometimes too much sleep and uh, paradoxically there are studies showing that if you uh, epidemiologically look at those that sleep long hours, they have also an increased mortality, which seems a little bit paradox because you yeah, just said that sleep is good. But the fact is that long sleep is often a signal or I would say a symptom of an underlying uh, disease. So sleep um, is a driving force of health, but sleep is also a tournesol uh, is a signal that something is not so well, so th we have to take uh, sleep, I think, overall more seriously than so, we did so far. So we should stick to the eight-hour average? Well, average, it's true. I mean, there are recent studies actually confirming that uh, this is what most people need, between seven and nine. There are a few exceptions. There are some long sleepers that uh, sleep longer and some short sleeper, but actually most people really need between seven and nine. And the tendency, unfortunately, is to decrease the hours of sleep and uh, actually taking sleeping pills. So mm. society is going a little bit in the other direction that sleep research and sleep physicians uh, uh, suggest. How has COVID-19 changed the landscape of neurological care from your point of view? Well, this is obviously a very complicated and very important question. First of all, uh, we because actually... Because COVID-19 was very related to neurological Sure, sure. Problems. I was going to say, obviously, we all suffered of the fact that uh, resources, human resources, and also, uh, I would say, medical and hospital resources were uh, diverged from, let's say, neurological care to general care. This happened also in my country, in Switzerland. Now, as you alluded to, we know that neurological complications are very frequent. Uh, 
depending on which statistic you look at, up to 20-30% of patients with COVID do have neurological complications. As president of the European Academy of Neurology, I also launched a systematic study, international study, which we call ENERGY, on the complication of COVID. So we learned that there is a neuro affinity of the, of the virus. And then we started also understanding that lung COVID uh, is also a disease uh, or a condition that is frequently accompanied by neurological problems. And there is also an overlap between brain and a mental disorder. So it's also exemplifying the need of a good collaboration between brain specialists and psychiatric mental specialists, which I think it's also one of the strategic decisions I took as a president to work closer with a psychiatrist and, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, for the good of our patients. Should we people maybe who went through the disease be more careful or go into certain uh, uh, analyses? Should we go to the, well, to the doctor especially I'm, I'm, to, no, to check? I don't, no, I don't think so. I mean, it depends really uh, on, on the presence or not of mm -hmm. residual symptoms. If you mm -hmm. have smell problems, if you have cognitive problems, there are some stu studies showing that long COVID may be accompanied by cognitive um, mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, other brain dysfunction. Then obviously, yes, um, fatigue is a very frequent uh, symptom, sleepiness, sleep disorders, smell problem I mentioned already. So if you have residual symptoms, you should uh, check uh, how to uh, best deal with them. And the complexity of long COVID is that you have mental and brain disorders together. So, it's so nothing hidden. Uh, it, there is some some symptoms to be yes, felt. Yes, usually, if, usually mm -hmm. you should you should have some perception of of a disturbance, and then you should look for a specialist. Yes. Please tell our audience more about the IGAP project, particularly the European Academy of Neurology's brain health strategy. You have uh, spearheaded. Well, yeah, I like to say that 2022 is really the year of neurology and neurological disorders. Why? Because for the first time the WHO has decided to uh, recognize uh, neurological disorders as a public health priority. Why is this the case? Well, first because uh, we start having very good data, international mm -hmm. scientific data showing that the frequency of neurological disorders is very high. We say that at least one person out of three in the course of its life or of his life, her life, will develop a neurological disorder. So it's very high uh, and this is uh, really uh, somewhat new in the landscape of scientific evidence. The second is that um, we have understood in the last 5, 10, 15 years that much of neurological disorders can be prevented. Uh, there are some estimation and recent publication saying that up to 40% of the phenomenon stroke, typical uh, neurological disorder or dementia and other neurological disorders, 40%, 50% can be prevented. Mm -hmm. So we have a tool to do something to decrease the burden of neurological disorders. I mentioned the frequency, I should say also the costs of neurological disorder, which are tremendous. And uh, for all these reasons, actually the, um, and I should also mention the fact that uh, the, um, the workforce for neurological disorder is still insufficient in uh, many uh, countries, uh, not only in Asia, South America, uh, but even in Europe, in some areas of Europe. So there are multiple reasons why actually the WHO has launched the IGAP, uh, the Intersectoral Global Action Plan on Epilepsy and Neurological Disorder, which actually puts uh, neurological disorders on the map of you know, health authorities. And the EAN actually has launched a brain health campaign just to accompany and support mm -hmm. this initiative and uh, actually we want to promote uh, this knowledge and we want to support uh, different national um, um, campaigns and initiatives that have started in Norway, in Germany and actually I'm starting an initiative in Switzerland I would be very happy to support also the start of such an initi initiative in this country. When you mentioned diseases that can be prevented what do you mean by that? Do you mean lifestyle? Well, as I mentioned, uh, you can uh, prevent them uh, by healthy diet, you can prevent them by promoting good sleep and enough sleep. There are some um, 
disorders or disease that should be treated early. You know, for instance, people do neglect the fact that if you start having cognitive decline dementia, you should treat cataract, you should treat hearing loss. So there is a number of um, measures and preventable um, uh, approaches that uh, may actually diminish you know, the risk of these disorders. Uh, also, uh, mental activity, physical activity. Uh, so there are a number of um, uh, approaches and measures that one should take into account to try to prevent some diseases that may be then difficult to be treated. With yeah. what age? Starting with what age? Well, you know, the uh, brain health strategy of the WHO and the same for the, w, uh, for the EN actually starts even before birth. So mm -hmm. the way you... The mother. Uh, the mother, the care. pregnancy. Mm -hmm. The education you give to your children, uh, the diet, I mean, we do know that non-communicable diseases, obesity are increasing, diabetes is becoming epidemic uh, in areas in Europe uh, and uh, worldwide. So I think it's, it's actually an approach that starts from early on and should not be started, let's say, uh, when you become demented. That's mm -hmm. often a little bit too late, or I should say too late, too definitely. Late. Mm -hmm. You still can promote brain health even if you get sick. I mean, we want to um, show that you can improve your mm -hmm. um, lives and also your quality of life, even if you started having you know, a neurological disease or if you had stroke, if you start having cognitive decline. But obviously, the more you start before, um, better. The, the, better the better you can uh, you can get the results uh, coming back to Romania why do you think does Romania need a national strategy for cerebrovascular disease well uh, stroke is a very frequent and very devastating uh, condition and I observed over the last 15 years a big uh, support of the creation of uh, stroke units the use of thrombolysis which is a treatment that can change you know, the lives of patients with acute stroke. But this is not sufficient. Uh, scientific evidence has shown in the last, I would say, 10 years uh, that also thrombectomy, so it's endovascular treatment, can be very effective. So I actually think that uh, the promotion now, not only of thrombolysis and stroke units, but also of complex stroke centers uh, where, um, you know, um, quite cumbersome treatment such as thrombectomy, where you have a need of endovascular therapist, um, endovascular neuroradiology, this should be promoted. And I, I welcome uh, you know, the steps and the measures that have been started in this direction. And what dimensions of brain health should be included in such an endeavor? At which levels of our health system? Well, it's a complicated um, uh, question because um, I think the intersectorial uh, um, global Action Plan, as the name says, stresses the fact that neurologists should partner with other uh, professionals, mm -hmm. uh, medical professionals. I'm thinking about the neuroradiologists I mentioned. I mentioned also the general practitioners that should be aware about the m preventive measures. But it's also about interprofessional work with uh, nurses and other you know, health uh, specialists. I'm thinking about also bioengineer and data scientists. The big data are becoming the clue for many approaches. So I think uh, neurologists and, and the care of neurological disorders should now uh, in include and embrace many other specialists. And this is what intersectoral is about. As I mentioned before, there are areas and countries where there is insufficient uh, neurological workforce. So you are forced to use other specialists uh, to deliver neurological care. Think about uh, Africa. There are countries mm -hmm. in Africa that have uh, zero neurologists. So I think the future is to really uh, work together, uh, including also the information of the general population. So there is also an awareness that needs to be increased about neurological disorder. A lot to be done, but I think this year, as I said, is an historical year, and I'm happy to be in Romania also to promote, um, you know, prevention uh, of neurological disorders, brain health, and everything that uh, turns around at this. Uh, um, conditions. We are also happy to have you here, happy and honored, and thank you for taking your time to talk to us and to offer us your insights. Thank you very much on this for your interest. And it's, a, it's a very interesting um, occasion for me to be here with all of you. Thank, thank you. you.